So on this episode of Next Door Neighbors, I have uh, somebody that I've been admiring on social media for a while because of my interests. Um, we have an elite uh, builder from Boston, Massachusetts, um, Nick Schiffer. Nick Schiffer, is that, am I pronouncing that correctly? Awesome. You are, yeah. Not a lot no, of people do. Uh, well, dude, English is my second language, so anytime I can't pronounce something correctly, it's uh, like, I bet you if I looked at a, a name that says Danielle, I wouldn't know if it's Daniel or Danielle. <laughs> Yeah, it's I get Skiffer, Skahiffer, Schiffer, it's all over oh, that's the place. A- but uh, I, I appreciate that, man. That's a that's an awfully nice. Intro. Yeah, no, um, yeah, Nick, I you you know a little bit about myself and what I do. Um, but then mm-hmm. it's a little intimidating yeah. talking to a guy like you because you're you're in the world of <laughs> high end high end people with high end homes, and you every time you you know. DIY, anytime I DIY something, and that's my, my niche, I guess, um, you always play in the back of your mind, what are builders thinking? You know what I mean? When, when, mm-hmm. when I'm doing this stuff. Uh, and I see the comments. Um, so uh, tell people a little bit about yourself and, and what you got going on. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Nick Schiffer. I own a company in Boston, Massachusetts called NS Builders. Uh, you know, as Alex said, we are a builder here in Boston. Primarily, for the last seven years, we've actually been really focused on renovations, high-end renovations, really detailed renovations. Uh, and about five years ago, it led us to starting our own cabinet shop. Uh, so we have a cabinet millwork division where we fabricate everything in-house. Uh, and then over the last 18, 12 to 18 months, we've really shifted our focus into getting into larger scale renovation, but primarily new construction homes uh, and really custom architecturally driven homes. Uh, that's where we set ourselves out in the very beginning uh, to to go after is to get ground up, uh, work with architects, kind of push the limits of you know how well something can be done, how well it can be designed, how creative it can be. Um, so yeah, so for the last eight years, you know, built the business from a carpentry business to a remodeling business to now a home building and remodeling business. Oh, interesting. That's the third tier that I never really thought anybody would take on because i was curious to find out what you were doing before and i've seen some content where you're actually in the trenches you got your tool belt on you're fabricating you're creating you're milling um is that your background is that what you're were you in the trades originally yeah yeah so my father owns a uh a fence company here in massachusetts um and i had worked for him i started working for him when i was 11 years old uh my grandfather owned it at the time my father bought it in 2001 but I had worked for him and it was just, I was immersed in it. Every, you know, everyone's blue, super blue collar, um, you know, fence contractors are, you know, it's, it's a difficult trade to be in. It's, you know, really physically, uh, taxing on the body. You know, a lot of the talent just wasn't, uh, weren't people that got into the fence industry cause they loved it. It was more like a labor force. Um, but I worked for him for 11 years from the time I was 11 years old to 22 years old. And I started sweeping the floors and then got into the wood fabrication. Um, I got into the metal fabrication. I got into installation. And I ended up going to college um, for a construction management degree, primarily because my, my, my mother had wanted me to be go to college. Um, I had considered dropping out, but I was, I, I've always been of the mentality of like, I just... I can't see myself quitting on something. I have to. I have to at least finish it, even if, even if I don't do well or I feel like it's a waste of time. I, I at least need to finish. Uh, and when I had finished, I got a job offer. Literally, like I think it was like two or four weeks after I graduated, to come work in high rise construction as like an assistant superintendent. Um, denied the job. Got a call back. They basically tricked me. Uh, got me the you know interview with them kind of fell in love with it and they offered me three times what my father was paying me so I was like damn like I can't I'm not sure how to navigate this uh it it put a huge strain on my father and I's relationship at the time um you know obviously worked through that or not obviously but we did work through that uh worked you know in commercial construction as an assistant super and then eventually an assistant project manager we did we were renovating um high rises and then we I basically worked on a high rise from new construction to about 85% complete. And at that point I decided to, um, 
kind of split from there. I, I you know, I, I tell the story, and my wife would tell a much more embarrassing story. But I, you know, I had met my wife, uh, kind of being in that area. She had worked in a similar area. We had seen each other all the time, and we started dating. And it was getting to a point where I was working so much for this company, doing high rise uh, work, that I started missing the the trades, and I was doing carpentry on the side. So it's like every Saturday, Sunday, you know, and if I could, I was working nights to kind of fulfill the need to be back in the trade. Uh, and ultimately, I always remember it as my, you know, my girlfriend at the time gave me the ultimatum of like, listen, I can't, like, we can't date and you working. You, I was working sometimes 140 Just hours. Just because you week, wanted to. You know. Yeah. Because I wanted to. I'm sorry, not 140, like 100 hours a week, not 140 would be ridiculous. 100 hours a week. So I was doing like 40 hours on the side and then I had a 60 hour a week uh, uh, day job. But I wanted to, but in, in, I, I liked, I liked both, both of my jobs. But ultimately I wanted to start my own company and I got to a point where I decided that I'm leaving. I'm going to start my own company. And I started a carpentry company, and I, that's exactly what I did. It was belt on. I was doing renovation work. I, I did a whole house renovation. Um, I did a whole house renovation by myself. I was literally like one person in this house for months. Um, you know, obviously I had a couple trades here and there, but um, I started. I that's that's what I started. I started as a carpentry company, and you know, I looking back now, it's like I don't I don't put the I haven't put the belt on in years. But I've found myself really appreciating um, and really enjoying building the business and navigating the, you know, the difficulties of building a business and also, you know, everything that comes along with it. I, I think when you mentioned that you worked about 100 hours a week because you wanted to, not because you had to, uh, there's a part of that that really resonated with me. Uh, let me ask you this question. Do you vacation well? Like, do you know, can, if, like you, can you take time off and just sit on the couch and watch a movie? Um, can I sit on the couch and watch a movie? <laughs> it's a difficult question. No, I mean, I, I, there's a couple questions there. Do I vacation well? I do, and I okay. owe that to my wife. Uh, she, she definitely was always the one that, like, forced, like, hey, we're going away. Uh, we're going, you know, we're going to... Uh, Puerto Rico and you know you, you're not bringing your computer and in a couple of years ago I actually went to California and I actually I had left my phone off the entire time and I, I'm, I've slowly I've gotten to a point where it's like I realize the importance of that especially with kids now you know I have three kids and it's like the you know I don't want to miss those things I don't want to miss the opportunity to travel we just went to California again and we you know I, my my youngest is 10 months old i have a three a three-year-old and a five-year-old and we tossed them all on a plane <laughs> and we flew out six hour direct flight to to uh la and then went down to newport beach for a week and you know i love that it's like i i get to bring the whole family it's you know so i do i think i do vacation well um sitting on a couch and watching a movie i i it, it's something my wife you know i feel like we we do after we put the kids down we'll sit down and watch tv um, and I can do it, but, but it's hard for me to not do anything for like a long yeah. period of time. Like I couldn't just wake up on Saturday. Like I, I can't remember the last, I don't think I've ever just woken up on a Saturday and plopped myself on a couch and watch TV all day. <laughs> I have a thing where I, I have to do like, I'll challenge myself. It's Sunday. The, I, cause I do have kids that are similar in ages. Um, we do have a one year old, so we are in the baby stage as well. And then we have a, a mm -hmm. six year old, so closest to year five. And then I also have an eight year old. Yeah. And, uh, you know, on Sundays after the, when the baby's napping, I'm like, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go watch a movie that somebody highly recommended to me. Sometimes it's a classic. And mm. I'll do this thing where I'm like, let's see how far I could put my phone and not touch it for the entire an hour and 30 minutes. Mm. And uh, I don't know. I think there's only maybe been a handful of movies that I've actually been able to do that. Other times you're like, there's always something mm. I wanted to look up. There's always an idea that I want to look into. There's always something. Oh, yeah. Don't forget to buy a pencil sharpener for the wood shop. You know what I mean? Like like little things like right, that. Yeah. Um, do you feel like you said now you're getting better at vacationing and stopping and kind of enjoying this time you with your kids? Do you feel a lot of that ha comes from finally getting, which I don't know what the pulse is of like the business, right? Like, I don't know if you're like, if the head's mm -hmm. above water, below water, but I'm assuming, um, do you feel like that came from 
that the business is kind of operating and flowing and doing its thing. And then you feel like you have this period that you can stop and smell the roses and savor these moments and not them let it get away. Um, no, I actually don't think it's related to that at all. I actually, because I think that the, the core of why I can vacation and the core of why I continue, because I don't think my business is flowing. I think that I'm still like on all fours climbing up this mount, mountain and, you know, and I'm all, I think I'll always feel that way. Um, because I, you know, I want more and more and more for the business. You know, I, we're starting other businesses. We're, we're exploring other opportunities. Like there's all these things that I, I want to achieve. And it's the same way. It's like, I think about that on the couch. It's like, yeah, I, I'm on my phone doing a hundred things. It's like, I want to, I want to get, I want to get ahead on that. So when I'm at work, work, like I can mm. focus on that and not, you know, not worried about getting the pencil sharpener. But, you know, I think that there's a couple things uh, from a mentality standpoint, and I looked at, I started realizing that we tend to operate with the worst case scenario in mind, right? And we had a we had a difficult client a little over a year ago, and you know there was it just it didn't go well. There was all this like threat of legal action, and and frankly, like and I and I fully believe this. My team executed at a very high level, and the client just was a very difficult client that wasn't ever going to be happy. Um, and I had a conversation with someone like, what if he, you know, what if he sues you? And I, and I paused for a moment and I was like, I mean, then he does like, like, well, he could put you out of business. I'm like, yeah, he could. He's like, well, you could lose your house. And I'm like, that, yeah, that could happen too. And it's the conversation just kept going. And I'm like, we're so far down like now like you could lose your car you what if you can't put shoes on your kids feet like what if they can't eat it's like you get all the way down this like path of negativity where it's like now everything your entire focus is around the fact that i need to go back to work i need to go figure this out i need to go i need to protect myself i gotta like where the reality is is like that's wor like worst case scenario and worst case scenario can get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse where it's like well, the likelihood of the best case scenario is probably pretty slim. So the worst case scenario is probably pretty slim. So you're probably going to end up somewhere in the middle where it's like it didn't, you know, the outcome wasn't great, but, you know, we move on. We're like, we have to, we have to focus on the growth of the company. So when I realized, like when I started really focusing on that and realizing that, you know, there's, there's always opportunity and there's always going to be, you know, uh, ups and downs. And, you know, I could sit here and be like, I can't go on vacation because this guy might sue me. It's like, imagine, li like, I think a lot of people live their life like that, where it's like, I can't go on vacation because my business is in disarray right now. Or, you know, I have a client that hasn't paid me and that's, that's unfair. It's like, I I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that that's not an issue, but I think that we put too much weight on the fact that like that is that that that's what determines whether or not you live life and you know and it's the same thing i the same thing when it comes to opportunities where you know there's I've, I've talked to people where we've been presented opportunities to build some really incredible projects and people are like do you think you're ready for that you know you don't really have the experience for it like you really haven't re earned the right to build something like that and i'm like i hear that but i could like i could literally die tomorrow Right. I could be gone tomorrow and, you know, or I could be gone in a year from like, why would I not take the opportunity to go after something? Like if I'm being presented with the opportunity in my eyes, then yes, I did deserve it one way or the other. Like that I'm only being presented that opportunity because something aligned with someone else believing that I could do it. So I'm going to execute on that. And I want, and I want to take that opportunity. What? And I, I no, just go ahead. No, please finish your thought. No, I was just. I was just gonna say, I, I think that too many people get wrapped up in like, I need to take one step at a time. I need, I need to, you know, before I do this, I have to do that. It's like, but that's not this, that you're, there's that saying, right? Where it's like no successful person has um, ever been become successful by doing what's comfortable. 
you know, it's like you, you have to be uncomfortable. Like you, you have to challenge yourself. You have to challenge the, the norm in, in which, you know, business typically operates the way that your friend's business might operate. It's like, you know, I don't like, I respect my friends, but it's like, I don't want their business. I want something different. I want something bigger, or shinier, whatever it is. It's, it's, I think that understanding that mentality and really like put, making myself believe it and just talking about it like like we are right now reminds me of you know why i'm doing what i'm doing and why i believe that you know we you can know it's great. interesting i again I'm, I'm resonating with so many things with you because i i feel like as you and i have two different types of uh businesses that we're running um the mindset is nearly identical right this this thing that creates that starts happening in the mind, like this breakaway. Cause I remember a period of time I've been doing YouTube for six years now and we're creating content. And I remember there was this, like I was telling my wife, we've been there for nine years going on 10, this, um, following, uh, next year. And, uh, I, I told her the person that she married is a completely different person than I am today. Like my mindset has changed so much. Mm -hmm. And that mindset is the ability to number one, believe in yourself. Number one, to do the difficult thing that nobody else wants to do. And number three, yeah. taking a risk, right? Putting on that uh, lion mindset and the lions don't care what the sheep are thinking about them. Um, right. I could definitely attribute to a lot of the content that I've consumed to shape that mindset and also lining up with physical things that I've did. Maybe it's uh, doing difficult things like I used to dread running and then next thing I know I'm training for a half marathon. You know, things like that while listening to guys like David Goggins, Jocko Willink, Joe I, I Rogan. I was just right? going to say, so I'm with you. Like I, so I just ran a, uh, the Boston uh. Marathon and I'm not, I'm not a runner. Now, how'd you qualify? And did I'm you not a do runner a at bunch all. of circuits to qualify for it or how did that work? No, I didn't qualify. We, I got, um, a okay. it was for a charity. So, pay, uh, raise money in part of a, a great charity, a good friend of mine, um, a good friend of ours has, but my wife had ran it. I was going to run it the next year. It got shut down to COVID and I ended up running it this year with my wife, but it, it wasn't something I wanted to do. It was like, I don't like running and I read Goggins you book. Can't hurt me. And I remember reading it. Yeah. Current, current hurt, can't hurt me. And I, I remember being like, man, I am such mm -hmm. a puss like that. Like I am, I have, I'm. I have, I'm privileged in many ways, which I'm, I'm completely aware of, but it's like, I'm not even challenging myself to be a better version of myself. And it's like, I, I didn't even train for the really? marathon. And I'm not saying that, I, I, I'm not saying that because like, I think I'm like Superman. Like I didn't run, I wasn't fast. I got it done. It, it, you know, I did it and everyone's like, why'd you do it? I'm like, because of the mental aspect, like beyond the charity, it was like totally mental. And I have been talking and I'll say it here on air because I keep I feel like if I keep talking about it, I have to do it is like I, I want to do yeah. a hundred miler and I don't want to do it because because of Goggins I don't want to do it because of the fact that you know I want to be a runner I want to do it because someone was like you can't do a hundred miles and it's like that like that right there is enough for me to be like all right I mean I know I can because at the end of the day it is it's it's completely mental. Well, Goggin says that Goggin says that and, it's, uh, when you think you can, when you think you're the most failing point, that you're like, I literally have to tap right now. And I don't know where he came to this number, but he's like, you're only at forty percent. Like that was right. always such weird. Which is, it, it's it's so wild, and to think about that, it's like, okay, um, it's when you just hearing someone say that, like, makes yeah. you believe it, right? Where it's like you feel that you're at that point, like. Man, I can't believe I'm only at forty percent. Whether it's true or not, right? Whether science can prove that or not, it's like it doesn't matter. The placebo has has been ingrained in your mind that you are only at forty percent and you are yeah. not quitting. And I agree. I think that you know the mentality. That's that's something you know. You I have to pay a lot of respect, uh, like a lot of tribute to social media. I've taken a lot from social media in a really positive way. And from business to, you know, my health, like being, putting my health, for, like I used to wake up at five, you know, five o'clock and I would be out of the door at five fifteen and right to work. And now it's like, all right, yeah, I'll get up at, you know, five, maybe earlier. And, you know, I wake up, it's like, that's my time. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to get, you know, I want to eat a good breakfast and, and I, ha and my day is better. Like I have more energy. I'm, I perform better. But it's everything. It's, you know, the way I eat, the way I think about, 
my conversations with people, the conversations with my wife, like, you know, how I present myself to a client, how I talk to my team, all of those things. I'm constantly like, I'm, I, it's getting to a point where I feel like I have an issue where I, 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 I'm assessing every single thing I do. And when I'm in a group of people, especially like for whatever reason around my wife, um, probably cause she puts the fear <laughs> of God in me, but, <laughs> but I, I sit there and I, and as I'm, I listen a lot, I, li- I listen a lot more than I did. I ever did. I, I was very much like, I want to talk, talk, talk. Now it's like, I listen and I I'll question, you know, all right. It's almost like I formulate my response and then I'll run it through a quick filter. Like, does this provide value to this conversation? Oh. And if it doesn't, then I'll like consider like, all right, maybe I'm not going to add, you know, this, it, it, you know, I don't need to have a smart ass remark in this conversation. It's not going to pay any value to it. And, you know, I've said that out loud and my wife's like, you're, you definitely have an <laughs> issue, some, you know, some sort of issue. But it, I think that the, the crux of it is like really, really being the best version of yourself. You know, Jeff Sweener, builder down in Rhode Island, he's, he's got this saying up on his wall, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And it's like, I remember him saying that and I, and I've talked to him a handful of times. I'm like, Jeff, it's like, you really screwed me up, man. It's like, like I'll, I'll, I'll like sweep the floor and like, I'll see like that you missed like a, a piece of dog food or like a piece of dust over in the corner. And it's like, I used to just be like, whatever, like it's you know, like, I'm going to sweep this tomorrow anyway. But now it's like, no, I have to do it. Cause how I do this is how I do everything. And it's like, or you skip a rep on Like you're doing bench press and you skip a rep and it's like, nope. Go back to the bench, do that last one. Do it, you know what? Do it all over again because you can't. You'll you be can't. on the treadmill and you're like, all right, I'm just gonna do a quick five miler, and it stops at like four point nine nine. And you're like, no, no, I, I, I have to. It has to be a five. Yeah, turn it has it to back be five. On. <laughs> turn it, it on. Yeah, it's. It, uh, what was your? What was your? Because I attribute to a lot of uh, my motivation today. Yes, it's driven by consuming a lot of this content that and it's so great mm-hmm. because you can have short form content on TikTok with some you know uh tony robbins giving you this like whatever mindset and right Pep and talk, then yeah. and then you can consume gary v telling you you're one video away or you you know look at goggins who says come on bitch right like you you have you have you have right. every <laughs> form of content to consume and that's that's something that i kind of always kind of ingest into my brain to kind of stay where i'm at but to me, a lot mm-hmm. of my, uh, I guess, drive also stems from the way I was raised, which like kind of trying to prove people wrong, right? I wasn't, yeah. I didn't, school wasn't easy to me. Uh, family relationships weren't great. And so a lot of that drive comes from that. It's maybe suppressing some things. Do you, what was your upbringing? Does it line up with that kind of like somewhat childhood trauma that's now fueled by today's energy of entrepreneurship? And that's what the finished product is that we're seeing with Nick? You know, I, I mean, my family, I was pretty old. Um, I think I was like 16 or 17 when my, my parents got divorced. Um, and they went through a terrible divorce. I was the oldest of four. So my siblings were 14, 12 and 10. So they were at like critical age when my parents went through a divorce. And it, I think it, you know, I, I'm not going to allow them to have that as their excuse, but I think that they definitely were impacted more. Um, but you know what? I don't, I don't think I attribute it to the way I was brought up and I don't think I'm trying to prove anything to my family. I think that I'm honestly trying to prove something to myself and you know, cause you know, anyone that's really in my life thinks that, you know, what I've done is great. And like, how could you, why would you want any more? How could you like, you don't need this much. You don't need that. You don't, you know, I throw around the fact that I want to buy a super yacht and it's like, you don't need a super yacht. I'm like, I know I don't, but I'd like to, you know, it'd be cool <laughs> if I could buy one. It's like magic. It'd be cool if I had $200 million just to hanging around yeah. and buy a boat and it's like the, the the likelihood of me achieving that, you know, is you know, low, probably low. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and be like, oh, you know what? I'm never gonna achieve a, a super yacht. So let, let, let's forget that mentality. But by the way, I'm, I don't want to cut I'm you off, but that was the most Boston thing I've ever heard you say is yacht. <laughs> yacht, yeah. It's, you know, I I, I try. You not have to a have zero of accent, it, and then you threw yacht in there. I know. So so. Side story, uh, when I started doing videos, my wife, 
I was watching them. She, I'm making her out to be such a bad <laughs> character. Me, I, I love my wife, Megan, <laughs> FYI. Um, but she she would watch the videos and she's like, Nick, you sound like an <laughs> idiot. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you sound like like a bot, like a like just a dumb Boston kid. Like you need to lose the accent. It's just you if you're gonna hit a bigger market, you just need to lose it. So I just kept trying not to drop my R's and 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 I, it, everyone tells me it's like where are you from i'm like boston they're like why why don't you have an accent i'm like well funny story my wife ripped it away from me but if you give me a couple a couple beers you know i'll, I'll probably i'll probably it'll probably i tell people out. the same story um, because i had a lisp as a kid and being an immigrant who moved from russia in 96 to the states i had the accent and a lisp so i had to focus on my enunciation to get rid of the lisp so would help get rid of the accent yeah yeah i had a i had a bad lisp until i was like I think in sixth grade. Um, and I think it took so long because I used to go to the speech teacher and just clean. I, I loved cleaning. So I would just go and clean her classroom. <laughs> and they were like, why isn't he Why isn't he learning anything? She's like, oh, I don't know. And little <laughs> did my parents know. I was just in there literally polishing the books. But um, that's funny. I Nick, I think you and I were separated at birth because then. my mom keeps telling me these stories about like when I was a kid and we all run into the house from a snow day. Everybody runs in the house, throws all their stuff, and goes in. And I was just behind folding. You I was folding it, their right? stuff. Yes. <laughs> Dude, I can't. Like, it's, you know, again, like, that's a, it's a very different characteristic from my wife. Like, she's okay with chaos. And I'm like, you know, she'll throw all the blankets in a, in a bucket. And I'm like, yeah. I want to fold them. And it's like, why would you fold them? The kids are literally going to take them out tomorrow. <laughs> and it's just, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, same thing with the shoes. It's like I, every time I clean, I'm like I organize every every pair of shoes. Like put every, like Marley's in one area, Reed's in another. Indies, and it's like, and every time I come home, I'm like, oh my god, there's like 40 <laughs> pairs of shoes, and, and and no one knows where they are. But yeah, it's very similar. Um, I don't know. It's you know, I, going back to like the whole mentality and like I, or proving, it it really is of like proving something to myself and I'm constantly you know I think I, I feel as though I'm really I'm super self-aware and I don't mean that just by like who I am and like what I'm doing but I also feel like in the moment of something I'm I'm like cognizant of the fact that my this is gonna sound really stupid but I feel like I can, I can sit and I'm talking to someone and I can feel like I, I can like open my brain up where it, in the sense like all right, like I am super hyper, hyper focused right now and I am allowing everything that's being told to me right now to to be absorbed. And and I feel like I I physically feel that. And it might be the coffee, but I physically feel it. And I think that throughout my day, you know, my my goal is to get as much done as possible. And I and I get a fair amount of work done. You know, I, I'm running a business. We're starting two other businesses. We produce content on a regular basis. I'm I'm running my social channels. I'm doing consulting, you know, on the side. Uh, in I'm doing two podcasts a week. It's like I know I'm I have a, a a list of things, like a good list of things I'm getting done. But I always know that I can do more, and I'm always looking to increase that and and be more regiment with like, all right, I also want to go to the gym five days a week. And it's like, I don't always go. And it's like, and that, and that kills me. It's like, I know my day is better and more productive if I go. And it's like, and if I, you know, perfect example, like we last, my wife and I love music. So we go to a concert last night. Yeah, we get home at 11 o'clock. It's like, probably not going to wake up at 4.30. Like, going to probably sleep until 6.30. It's just like, yeah. I'm going to be trash if I, if you, I wake up. A lot of people are going to be shocked because you called 6.30 sleeping in. Because I know what you're talking about, but a lot of people would be like, whoa, 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 sleeping in? Yeah, I just, no, I mean, it, uh, 6.30, it's like my day, uh, I got to right. start my day. And it's like my goal is to be in, the, like, at my, at work, like, answering emails, if it's job site or my office, by 7. So, like, if I, whatever I want to do before that, it's like, that's on me and I need to wake up accordingly. But it is, it's like the, you know, the more I can pack into my day, the the better I feel and the better I feel like I have the opportunity to, you know, get to the next. Do you? Uh, I love it because I, the idea of being introspective is something that I was just talking to my wife uh, the other day. And I was 
I was like, of all my brothers, I was like, I feel like I'm the only one that has this like awareness of like, of the way I act, the way I speak. And you're, I'm always trying to tweak it and mm -hmm. how certain things make me feel and how certain people make me feel. And that's where you start cutting right. out cancerous mindsets away from your life. Um, do you like you you're, as a father, what, uh, and I was just talking to a friend about this the other day, and we're talking about how do we continue this? And there's the saying, and I know you say it because I bet you, you and I consume enough Joe Rogan podcasts that to fill our ears, but that <laughs> saying that hard times create hard men, hard men create mm -hmm. uh, soft times, soft times create soft men. Um, do, how do you instill this in your kids without damaging them? Do you have a theory behind that, to how to continue this mindset? I don't, and this is what I'm struggling with. Um, you know, perfect example, my daughter Marley, she's my oldest. She, We signed her up for soccer. She went out in the field first day, scored literally seven goals. It was the best day of her life. And I'm like, this is amazing. Like, I feel like she's so, she's so pumped. Day two, goes out there, doesn't score a goal, cries on the sideline. She's five or four at the time. And I'm like, and my wife's like, real, like my wife's mad. Like, like you have to go back out there. This is like, stop. There's nothing to cry about. And I had, I was, I had the same reaction. And then the, the, the second day it happened and it was the same thing. You know, my wife's upset. Like I'm, I'm, and I'm sitting there, I'm like getting upset. Isn't like, we know it's not the right answer here. So third day we try again and I pull her aside. I'm like, Marley, you, like you, and I'm trying to explain to the fact that it's like, you know, we don't, you don't always win. You know, you can't always win and you have to be okay with that. And, and I've been trying to instill it. Like we were playing air hockey and she lost, like I play, like obviously not playing, but I'm, I'm not going to not let, I'm not going to let her win is what I'm getting at. Right. I want her to realize that she's not always going to win. I'm not going to, you know, like, yeah, she'll win some. I'm not going to just dunk on her. <laughs> but I, I realized, like, I, I, I started thinking about this, and I'm like, I have to get her to understand that winning and losing are, are equal, like, equal. Like, there's still progress being made. And she was really upset about something that she lost the other day. And I sat her down, and I told her, I was like, Marley, you know I go to work every day and I lose almost every day there's very few times I go to work and I win and she looked at me and I felt like she actually understood like she was like oh I thought like she in her mind she was like I was going out and winning and so I don't I, I don't necessarily have a theory and I'm actually super worried that I'm not going to instill the right mentality in my kids but I think that I will make the my best effort to to allow them to understand that you know it's you know winning and losing is they're equal they you you still make progress but that whole that whole mentality of like how you do one thing is how you do everything um because I do I uh, the, the Joe Rogan and uh what's his name um that had that that uh oh, yeah. Jordan Peterson and it's like you know I I, I I like listening to, to, to Jordan and his whole, he was on, I think it was Rogan's podcast when he said that you need to be yeah. a monster and you need, and, and, and he goes on. It's like, it doesn't mean you're not a kind person. It means that you're vigilant and it means that like you're, you're, you're trying to like biohack who you are to be, again, be the best version of yourself. And I do look at a lot of my peers and even some of my family and I'm like, I know like, you know, some of my siblings, you know, they struggle. I think they struggle to understand that they have the opportunity, the same opportunity, and they take this, you know, victim approach, which I simply don't yeah. agree with. Um, but they're, but it, they're soft. It's like you're, you're not, you're not, you're not mentally hard. You're not, you're not putting yourself in a position to to grow. You're, you're putting yourself in the position that you're hoping that someone feels bad enough yeah. to help you. I, um, yeah, it's the same, it's the same question I ask myself all the time as well. And uh, what started ask, what started prompted me to ask these questions to my kids, um, is, um, you know, it's kind of weird that having an eight year old because eight now they start getting a little bit lippier with you. They have their own 
not mm. I wouldn't say they're like 11 or 12 year olds from based off of some of my older friends uh, the way they uh, illustrate it but it's not like that they have their own opinion but they're starting to see boundaries they're starting to see barriers they're starting to see like uh, like that you might be a little bit too much. So I realized once he turned eight, I was like, I can't yell at you anymore. Like, I just can't because right. I think I'm going to start ruining things and I'm going to try to push my right. mindset and my perspective on you. And then eventually that's going to push you away. But one thing I right. did carry from recently, I learned to ask them when they both, the six-year-old and the eight-year-old, the boys, when they come home from school and you ask them how was school, right? But I try to be a little more specific. Mm. I'd ask them questions is like, what did you fail at today at school? And I'd, for mm -hmm. the first, maybe I've been only doing this for maybe th three months at tops, maybe even two. And, uh, and at first they're like, ah, I don't know. You know, we, uh, we did long math and that was kind of hard, but I was like, no, no, no. What did you fail at? Like something that you didn't want to do and you weren't comfortable with and you did it and you sucked at it and you failed. And, uh, right. And then I would, they eventually would find one thing or another. And I would try to celebrate those things. Now, I got this from somebody else. This is not my own wisdom, but I got this from somebody else. And with the somebody else, when they were say, talking about it, that their parents did that to them when they were young, it redefined what failure was in that child's mind. Failing is just not mm -hmm. trying. And if you constantly live in right. fear, then you're definitely not trying and you're always failing. But if but failure is not, right. I started a business and that that business rolled over and tanked two years later down the road. That's not failure because at that point you've created, no. like you said, this monster who says like, no, you can't stop me. I know what my talents are. I know what my skill sets are. And, mm -hmm. and this is the best one is something that I don't know. I know where those resources are. And I think you're a prime example of that. I was like, this is where I wanted to start digging into is, you know, I, I, right before this podcast, I was like, I want to see what his website looks like. And I went on your website and it's perfect. It's elegant. It's it's done so perfectly. And then you see, your, I see a roster of your staff, and you could see as a guy who produces content, I, and you produce content as well. But like you, you, you always appreciate good content when it's put together, right? Whether it's like the same background mm -hmm. that's used cleverly, or if it's like just the, the aesthetics of things. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, uh, if first of all, how, where, and what drove you to start finding out the key personnel that need to be part of your team, right? Because you got creative directors, you have directors of, you know, mill work, you have client personnel, like you have uh, roles that an average person starting a business would not have, except for maybe a fortune 500 mm -hmm. company, right? Like you have the director mm -hmm. and the director of interns and you have director of, you know what I mean? Where, where did that come from? Like, where did you go to find these solutions and these resources? Man, um, I would, I mean, everyone that has come into this business with the exception of very few, uh, have been through Instagram. Um, and it, you know, really building the business, building the brand. We, we, I spent, you know, I appreciate the compliment on the website. I spent an enormous amount of time like tweaking that thing for literally over a year and, but everything has always revolved around brand and, and for, you know, I wanted to make sure that we were portraying not only a really good brand, but also a really honest and authentic brand. And people were, you know, gravi like gravitated towards that. And, you know, business on social media, they, they want to be part of it, but what, a lot of people don't totally understand or maybe appreciate, I, I don't know if appreciate is the right word, but how early we are. We're a young company. We're still growing. We've made huge leaps in our, our business. We've made massive improvements really quickly because I've been able to find people to help us do that. But we're still, there's still growing pains. And there's some people that understand that and can, can focus on what five, 10 years will look like for us. And there's other people that are presented opportunities like, hey, we've already got our stuff figured out. So why don't you come work for us? Mm. And, you know, and, and that I can't fault them for that, you know? So as far as finding the right people, I think that it is about sharing mentality, um, especially for those upper level like directors. 
right? So like Ken's the director of Millwork, um, you know, he shares a very similar mindset as myself. Like he, he understands the goal. He understands what, you know, we're trying to accomplish with the business. You know, Doug, who's my director of operations, he handles all the video creation. He's the same, he's the same way. It's like, he understands what the, the potential is with us as a company, us as a brand, you know, I would say maybe even more so than anyone else because he's so immersed in like, you know, what we're creating and what we're showing and what we're, we're, what we're producing. He's, you know, he's got terabytes of footage of what we've done for the last six years and, or, or eight years, I should say. And, you know, someone, someone that is that connected to what we're doing, you know, it's easy for them to, easier for them to understand what our like what uh you know what direction we're going where it's like you look at some of the guys in the field and that i don't not that i don't have a relationship with them but i'm not with them every single day and that those are the people that you know deserve more of my attention and don't always get it and you know i think that not everyone's going to share the same mindset there's there's just you know unless you have a small crew, in my opinion, there's always going to be some people that are here for different reasons, but I'm also okay with that. Um, at the end of the day, it's, you know, they need to understand, they don't have to agree with it, but they need to understand what the, my goals are as an individual, which trickle into the professional, trickle into the, to the business and, you know, and, and hopefully share a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of similarities there, uh, for our growth. Yeah. Did you, is it from schooling that you learned that you needed particular roles to fill, right? Because if I was to take a shot in the dark and I envy what you do and, and, and I always romanticize the idea of, of in the future, I was like, well, if I'm already making a living creating content and I'm just remodeling my own houses and then flipping my own houses, what, and I, I, I have the ability to market some things, uh, could I with proper training, education, and mentoring, start a local, you know, company that either remodels, right, or becomes a builder. I have zero ideas of the type of roles that need to be filled. I know I need a, you know, a cabinet guy. I know I need a flooring guy. I know I need an electrical guy. I know those trades. Yeah. But you have such an intricate role. Like, I mean, I guess all the roles in your companies are so intricate that, uh, how did you how did you come up with the, the needing those roles? Was it through education or is it through just? No, I think it. I think it's you know one of the benefits that you know our podcast, The Modern Craftsman, has allowed is that I've been able to sit down with two hundred other people in this industry for two to three hours, and you know selfishly, I'm I'm asking them questions to figure out how to add on to my business to make my business take my business to the next level. So it's like, you know, creative director, it's like, well, that that role came from the fact that Doug wasn't just videoing. He was doing more than that. He was creating, he was making creative. He was, you know, directing it, he was producing it. And we decided that, you know, that his role would be creative director and that would expand, that would allow that division of the company to grow. Um, Ken, director of millwork, it's like he was a cabinet maker. And then we grew a team and it's like, well, it could be lead cabinet maker, but he's doing more than that. He's, he's also pricing the cabinetry and the millwork and he's also handling some of the design. It's like, all right, well, like, so you're the director of that division. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we just recently hired director of operations and you know, that was a, a strategic move in the sense that I needed someone that could fulfill, could fill my shoes where I was the bottleneck for my guys in the field. So, Peeling all of that away, not, you know, none of those roles are quite, you know, they're not necessary, especially if you're getting into, you know, smaller type projects, you know, you need a guy that's going to be able to supervise the job. That guy might also be a good carpenter. Now you have a lead carpenter slash super, you know, we're, we're really focused on the bigger picture and the bigger projects. So we have a director of operations that oversees the project managers. The project managers are different than our site supers. And our site supers, they're on site overseeing subcontractors and self-performed work. So we've taken, I would say that a lot of these roles have come from my experience in commercial. 
and and understanding you know the client liaison like she you know rachel is someone that you know handles client communication when the job's done warranty thing warranty issues um maintenance issues you know additional work be like small projects like she's she is hand like she's the client's direct point of contact we're done with construction they don't have a site super anymore they need someone that they can call because before it was just calling me and like hey the sink in my bathroom is clogged can you send someone over here and it's like if i have the the capacity to get someone over there or even the mental you know the mental capacity to remember when i hang up this phone that i need to schedule the plumbing yeah. i realized that that was like that was a hole that i need to fill so we you know i was like all right i need someone that's going to be a liaison to our clients and if we're going to be working for discerning clients and clients that demand a really high level of execution and a high level of um you know quality and detail and, and they're paying a, a high premium for that then we also need the the service to back that up. So a lot of it came from necessity, but you know, it was also, it also came from the ability, my ability to have sat down with other people and just constantly, again, look at what I can improve within myself. When I, um, when I first got started in, um, creating content, um, I needed to pay for the tools before the sponsorship came in. I had to figure out how to pay for all these tools. And I remember I would take on custom builds, uh, commission uh, builds for people. And one of the things that made me stop doing it is was I was a hundred, I was so insecure about when the product was finished because I would, I, I never had formal training. So, you know, joinery is something I, I learned from a YouTube video or maybe Instagram. Um, design and structure um, was learned, was just a theory to me. Um, and one thing that I was always fearful of is that one day that somebody calls me and be like, hey, those uh, mid-century modern tapered legs that you put at 20 degrees, oh yeah, one of them broke off, right? So mm -hmm. as somebody in your position who you have skilled tradesmen that are working with you and for you uh, and collectively as a team, and you're constantly taggering that along with uh, pushing the envelope of design, right? Because I've seen some of your stuff and it's like, man, they are, they're working with small spaces and everything is, is uh, manufactured from scratch. It's not like a kit that you go buy, like whether it's a little utility door that's aesthetically appealing, goes behind tile, like everything is just kind of fabricated in house. Um, what does that look like when the client gives you a call you know, five years or three years from, from then. And you just had to like come up with the solution that didn't exist because you pushed the design mm -hmm. envelope. Does that give you anxiety or do you just have this like operation or order of operation that comes in? Uh, I wouldn't say it gives me anxiety, but there's definitely times where, you know, I'm sitting here thinking of two examples where I know that they failed. I had a client reach out. We, we built a, a, a shower and frankly, the architect designed it, but they asked for like a, a teak, a wood teak floor and then a teak curb that the glass sat on top of. And I was like, you can't sit the glass on top of the teak. We'll have to build the teak around the glass and blah, blah, blah. Well, a year or maybe a year and a half after the build, like the, the curb was twisted and, and, you know, it had mold underneath it and it just was well, like, it didn't work. It fa it was a, a complete fail. So I was just like, "Yep, no problem." We went over there. I and I just, I just fix it. Like it's, I'm not gonna sit there and like dwell over it. It's like I ripped the glass out. We built a stone curb with a different material. I end up, cust like I actually had it milled to match the baseboard around the room. So when it went in, it looked like the baseboard float flowed all the way through, and it was like one piece. And it's that's just we have to we have to operate that way. And, you know, I think about, I told this story at, um, the builder show a couple of years ago is that, you know, I, I, in college, I was building this curved pergola and I, I, I'll, I was that, that one, I had anxiety all the way through. Cause it's like, I got off on the wrong foot. I didn't know, really know how to fabricate it. I, I built it and, you know, I kept taking these like weird shortcuts for no reason. And I was, I was like, I know I can get to the end result if I keep just going. And it was like literally throwing Bondo on it, trying to make it look right and make it, and, and just kept going and going and going. And I had never told that story before. And I remember I, on, on stage telling the story I was, and I committed, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go back to that client's house. Now this is 
10 plus years ago, I guess. I don't even, I don't even know how old I am, <laughs> but, um, yes, it's, it's going to be over 10 years. And I, I got home and I, I got in my truck and I drove to that wow. house and, and I couldn't find, I couldn't find the house. So, uh, I looked up their name, I found their address and I realized, Oh, that's the house right there. They painted it a different color and they ripped the pergola down. Ooh. And I was okay with that. Like it was, you know, if it was still standing or if it was falling down or whatever, I would have, I would have knocked on the door and said, Hey, I want to replace that. Like I was pr- totally prepared to do it completely for free, yeah. but it, it, it was out of their life. They hadn't replaced it with something else. Like it was, it was, it was beyond. Um, but it's just, you know, that it's the uncomfortable side of like, if we're going to push the level of creativity and do something different, yes, there's, there's always going to be, you know, the, the fear of like, how's that going to hold up over time? Or how's it going to, you know, is it really, is it too fragile? Like, you know, if you look at it, is it going to break? Like, does that, is it practical? So there is the level of understanding that, you know, some of this stuff is new and we have to be okay with the fact that it might fail. But when we are doing it, like when we are putting it in place, we need to make sure that we are, we're, we're operating in or we're executing at a really high level. Meaning that if we're going to do this, we need to do it to the best of our ability. Like let's go for this crazy detail, but we need to really think it up. That's be- you know, and, and, and just totally understand like the repercussions if we don't. Yeah, no, that's that's a great way. I love the way you addressed it. You're like, when the shower curb f- failed, you're like, yep, it failed. Um, let's make it right. Like, there's none of that. Like, well, first, let me explain to you why it failed. You know, we're pushing the design right. idea. Have you have you been cleaning the water <laughs> off it every day? Like I told you, like, do you make sure it doesn't get wet? It's like I could sit there and make all yeah. like, frankly, it was probably due to the fact that they didn't maintain mm-hmm. it. Right, right. But I, what I can't expect that out of my clients. Yeah. I can't expect the fact that my clients are going to maintain this stuff to the, like, look at the way people treat their cars. Yeah. It's like, I know people that don't never change their oil and then a motor blows. And it's like, what the hell? It's like, what do you mean? What the hell? There was no engine oil in it anymore. Well, that's why you buy a 96 Honda Civic. You change the oil once and you drive it till it's 500,000 miles. That's how that works. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. My first car. Totally. Um, <laughs> So tell me more about like what made you, because you're some of the, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but maybe in my eyes, you're one of the first people in the industry who's building and remodeling and renovating homes. And then, but you're also documenting it with a high production level uh, of a team. Like yeah. how, where did that inspiration come from? Um, I would, I mean, Instagram specifically, I remember I posted this picture of this deck I built. Um, it had a curved stair, stair on it, um, completely subbed the, the curves out, but it looked cool. And I put it together and someone reached out to me. It was like, hey, I saw you post on Instagram. I'd love to work with you. I was like, what? I was like, what do you mean you saw my stuff on Instagram? Like, yeah, you're building that cool deck. And I noticed that you had Festool tools. So you must know what you're doing because like that's some pretty expensive stuff. And I was like, okay. And I like it was... It was like, it was immediate. I was like, this is, this is, a, this is, this is powerful. This is, there's, there's power here. And so I just started kind of going all in on that. And when I, um, I, I basically, when I started doing it, I was, you know, everything I do, I have this like obsessive, you know, personality where it's like, I want to know how to do it better. Like who's doing it the best. And that's when I, it was, you know, eight years ago at this time. I came across Vaynerchuk and it was like right when Vaynerchuk was starting to like, you know, really promote, really be in everyone's face. And I was like, wow, like, like he documents what he does every day. The daily V show, like, um, ask Gary V. Like I was like, this is, this is super interesting. So I started paying attention to what he was doing and, and almost just copying it, like in my version. And we had done a renovation on our own home. And I had reached out to Doug at the time and Doug was, you know, he was working for another production company and I was like, Hey, I want to film this renovation, like start to finish. And we probably did like six or seven episodes. We never finished it because we, we end up like basically running out of money and we just couldn't finish the house. And we, I mean, eventually got it done, but like videoing it wasn't my priority at that point. 
but it gave me a taste of like being on camera and I started really appreciating camera video and seeing how people were able to like narrate or communicate their story, you know, prior to ever meeting someone. And that's where I like, like when Snapchat came out, it was like, I was immediately on the Snapchat stories, you know, showing like the behind the scenes. And then when Instagram got stories, I was like, all right, let's go back to Instagram. And I just was like, let's, I'm just going to show who we are behind the scenes, what we're doing, what we're doing, like what we're working on, talk to about, the, you know, talk to you about the details. And as that progressed, I just, you know, it got to a point where I was like, Doug, I want you to be full time. I want to, I want to document everything we do at a really high level to just really communicate who we are as a builder. And also, you know, again, Vaynerchuk being the, this, you know, kind of what jumped me into it. But then it just started, I started really, you know, consuming different kind of content outside of our industry to understand like how I can navigate uh, sales and marketing in, in my, in my business. And with, you know, with my focus outside the industry, it really allowed me to kind of jump ahead because no one in the industry was doing it or very little or, or wasn't very relevant where it's like, I was talking to guys that sold sneakers. It's like, how do you sell sneakers? He's like, Oh, I run targeted Facebook ads. And I'm like, what's targeted Facebook ad? He's like, Oh, well, you, you know, you can do this. And I'm like, and I obsessed over it. And it's like, I want, not that I, not that I want to be a Facebook ad manager, but it's like, I want to understand it. Cause I think there's, there's potential here. And I ended up experimenting with it. And I was like, I'm going to start running targeted Facebook ads that we are a, a home builder in these areas. And we only do new construction homes because we weren't doing them. And my, it was like, I'm not going to say immediate, but all of a sudden we went from, you know, everything renovation to 80% new construction. Wow. And it was, you know, and, and it wasn't just the Facebook ads. It was everything. It was the story that we were telling on social media, the, the caption underneath the photos rather than like, Hey, look at this vanity we built. It's, Hey, look at this awesome bathroom part of this house we renovated. It's like that, that changed the entire narrative of, the, of that same photo. One talks about the millwork you built. The other talks about the bathroom, which happens to have a piece of millwork you built, but it's part of a house. And a house to, to people is something that you build, you buy, and you live. Yeah. So I mean, that's, I mean, I can't imagine the bandwidth that you have to be stretched at to focus on running and gunning a business, uh, building a dream within this business, and then or the branding, right? And then you have a whole different world, which is content creating. Like, mm -hmm. where do you, do you just allocate? Because people have the same excuse, right? There's, I don't have time to do that. I don't want to start learning another app. I don't want to, do you allocate certain time? But that's just an excuse, well, of course, right? It's like, I don't want to learn TikTok. It's like, you don't have to, mm -hmm. but don't, t don't come to me and say that you don't have any business. Right. That's the, that's the thing. It's like, er, not everyone has to be on TikTok. No one has to be on social media, but you can't be anti social media and complain about the fact that you don't have business. If you're thriving, it's like, I don't, I don't need to be on Instagram. You're right. You don't. But if you, but again, like if you are going to complain about business, then yes, you are wrong. If you need to be marketing, your marketing needs to be where the people are. So I, you know, I think I could be better. I, I think that I'm like, I, I, to let's steal David Goggins. I literally think I'm, I'm operating at 40% right now on social media. Yeah. Like, and, 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 and cause I, cause we sit here and we've narrated like our content model and how, and the strategy and we can produce one piece of content a video and i can uh, i can turn that into 50 plus pieces of of content after that and we've net we've built it we've tested it we've ran it and it works so you know to to peel a curtain back so doug doug films let's just talk, use site visit site visit is like instagram stories but produced and put on youtube that's what site visit was. It's like me going to a job site, point and shoot, one take, run through the job, what's going on, and that's it. 20 minutes. That video gets taken. It goes on YouTube, Facebook. There's two. Then I take and I make multiple small – I shouldn't say I. Doug will make multiple small videos out of it, maybe four. Those four can go on Facebook, Instagram. Um, you, um, they can go on YouTube with the YouTube shorts and LinkedIn. 
And then, then there's probably eight. I, he, he'll give me 80 photos from a day. Like he'll just shoot as he's filming. So I, I have hundreds of thousands of photos in my phone, not my phone, but in Dropbox. And as I said that out loud, I realized that sounds like someone's like, oh, everything's in Dropbox. Let's break in and take it. <laughs> um, well, you heard it, folks. So now, I'm now, yeah, now I'm paranoid. But, um, but so now I have all these photos that, again, I can use on Instagram, yeah. Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever. And then those same short videos I can upload to TikTok. And, but, but not only that, now, so that's all stuff that I'm doing. Like Doug will post it on YouTube, but I promote it everywhere else. I, I upload it to everywhere else. I write the captions. I'm the one talking with people. I'm answering DMs, comments, whatever. But, but I'm also taking that video, which we do once a week. So every week we get a, a, a long length video. That video, we, we rip the captions out of it. I send it to a writer and she creates a blog. Yeah. And she takes the blog and it goes on the website. And now my website has an updated blog every single week. It's, it, and, but, but yeah, I know yeah, you're shaking yeah. your head and I, in that you're, you're the same thing happened when yeah. I realized I was like, wait a second. I'm like, that that's a hack like yeah. like a good like that's a that like not a hack like like oh she's a hack that's a hack meaning like i just like figured out a cheat code i don't think it's a cheat like, code i don't think uh, it's a cheat code i think what i what, what i'm shaking my head about is how many people like i'm just thinking about how many excuses i was hear from people and it's so rare you know how much time that t- takes 20 minutes to film yeah. site an hour to film site visit and then you know Let's call it maybe a half hour a day if I'm if I if I'm regimented. Yeah, no, it's like well, no, but it's finding the solutions and it's finding the ways to optimize it because people will be like, oh, I just don't have time for this. Obviously, all in all, we don't have time for everything. But if you start like putting people who are good at their job in those positions, like it started with me the same way when I started YouTube, I used to run four cameras plus a slide cam at once to take one take and then edit, sit there and edit. And then after a while I would send to my, my, my editor and he would bring it back to me. But now like this operation that we sit down is like, Hey, if we want to do three YouTube videos of uh, a month, plus Instagram, plus YouTube, or I'm sorry, plus Facebook, plus TikTok and all that stuff, plus creating a podcast, you got to get somebody else to, to help you with this stuff. Right? So now he'll, yeah. Kyle will shoot it. Then he'll create a social clip on it that will run on Instagram and Facebook that we'll make money off of. And then he'll get me screen grabs that we can post for stories. We can post for things because mm. they're high resolution. Nowadays you can get a camera when you get a screen grab, it's as good as any picture you could ever take. Like the pixel. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. It's, it's wild. Yeah. But people will just sit there and be like, Oh, I can't can't do that because I'm just consumed with work. Well, I just think you're just dealing in a fire and you never stop things and you've never optimized your life. You never figured out of how much sleep do I need? You've never figured out of what activities do I need to do or not do to make sure I'm running at full potential. And then after that, you sit down and you schedule your life, you know, whether it's me, I have a calendar with sticky notes and knowing when posts go live and what I promise to what brand, like it's all organized. And then you realize, oh, there's this mm. other thing I have now this bandwidth. Because to me, I will start the day at five o'clock in the morning, but the day is done at three for me because I want to be front and center with my kids, right? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I can only imagine your frustration with other people in trades that come to you and be like, hey, I have a carpentry business. What advice do you have for social media? Like, I can only imagine the frustration. Yeah. And so, you know, there, so I'm working on something regarding that. And I'm not going to, I can't th- disclose too much, but we are working on, you know, something to help this industry other people that want to do what we've done with social media um we're gonna gonna launch it in january but you know i do i think that i've i'm aware like i i know i've done a a good job with social media i i think that i'm still operating at a low percent and i think i can get better and we're making the the efforts to to be better um you know i've been very you know fortunate to be connected with people that are in the industry that have done, you know, video production in different industries and just been able to talk with a lot of people. Uh, more recently, I'm talking with like a talent manager to understand like how to break into particular markets, how to partner with like the right kind of brands, all of these things. But the, you know, the, the goal is, is like, I want, you know, I want NS builders to be a really big empire. I want us to be working around the country, building the craziest homes. That's what, that's what I want. I I don't want to, I, I'm not content with just being mediocre. I'm not content with just building in one area in in the same 
same home over and over. I want to work with really, really discerning clients and, and architects that push the level of creativity to a really, really high caliber that makes it challenging. And, and while doing that, I want to document the whole thing. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Nick, that, that is incredible. I, I love when I meet other people who are always thinking content and not to mention always building, also building an empire before that. Um, mm-hmm. I know it's five o'clock. It's family time where you are. Um, tell people where they can find you. Tell them more about your podcast so they can go get connected with you. Sure. Um, so I am the co-host of the Modern Craftsman podcast available on all, all the apps. I also run the NS podcast, uh, also available on all the apps, a little bit more of a sneak peek behind the NS builders operations, some of our projects and just general conversations about how we run the business. Um, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, you can find us on all of those platforms at NS builders. Um, and then our website, nsbuilders.com. Beautiful, man. Thank you for taking the time, man. I appreciate it. This is fun. Awesome, man. Thank you so much.